I invite you to turn with me back to John chapter 3. We preached from John 3.16 last week. We wanted to talk about love. Well, we're going to back up and, and uh, set the context. And, and really, it's kind of a follow-up, I guess, message to the one last week. Lifting up Christ. In this context, Jesus talks about His being lifted up. He's talking about being lifted up on the cross. And certainly, He don't need to be crucified again. And thank God for that. But you and I are to be in the business of lifting up Christ as far as exalting Him before this world. As far as lifting Him up by our speech, by our actions, by ministry, by preaching, by music, we are to be lifting up Christ. And so that's our topic today, lifting up Christ. When you found your place, will you stand with me? We're going to begin reading in verse number 1 of John chapter 3. Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knoweth not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray. Dear Father, we bow once again in your house. We thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you again, Lord, for your love. We thank you, God, for forgiveness. We confess our sin and ask for your forgiveness and for your cleansing. God, I ask for your help today. Help me to teach your word and make it, make it understandable, God. Help me to teach it in a way that it's receivable by, by the saved and the lost that each one of us will see our need in this message today and, and allow you to uh, change our lives and, and uh, cleanse our hearts, God. Every one of us, maybe we need to be more busy lifting up Christ through uh, our life, through our ministry, testimony, uh, preaching, witness. Maybe it's we need Jesus. Maybe we need to recognize that He is the Savior that we need. But I just ask you to uh, uh, draw people unto Jesus and reveal our need unto us that we can... We can make those things right. I pray for salvations today. In Jesus' name, amen. So Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Jesus here is speaking to him about the new birth. As we read through this third chapter, we find out that Nicodemus is first told about his first birth, physical birth and also about the necessity of being born again, the spiritual birth. Then very carefully, in words that Nicodemus could understand, Jesus told him of the cross. Again in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now since Jesus even described Nicodemus as a master in Israel, in other words, he... He was a ruler, a teacher. He, he had a master's degree in uh, Jewish religion, in Old Testament. He would have known what Jesus was talking about. You see, in Numbers 21, I'm going to read that for you uh, for context. 
In Numbers 21, beginning in verse 4, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, or to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, in this context, those who believed God and looked on the bronze serpent lived. Now, the New Testament uses this incident as an illustration of Christ's vicarious death on the cross and the necessity of personal faith for salvation. Here in our text verses. So because of their murmuring and sin, God allowed snakes to attack His people. When Moses interceded for them, God told Moses to make this brass serpent snake and put it on a pole where it could be seen. When the people looked upon this brass serpent and had faith, they were healed of the snake bite. Jesus became sin for us when he died on the cross. There's the example. Nicodemus understood that it was faith in what God did that healed the nation. And that faith in the Lord who would be crucified that would take away his sin. Now, as I said, the title of this message is Lifting Up Christ. Now, when Jesus spoke of this here, He's talking about being lifted up on the cross, and Nicodemus understood that. But there are ways that you and I can still lift up Jesus. He don't need to be crucified again. Thank you, Lord. But we need to be lifting Him up with our voice. We need to be lifting Him up with our uh, ministry. We need to be lifting Him up with preaching the Word, with, with a right life. We need to be lifting up Jesus that others around can see Him and can know that He's the answer to their need, their sin problem as well. I noted three ways that you and I can lift up Jesus. I want to focus on them for just a few moments today. Uh, you and I can lift up Christ in music, in ministry, and in message. First of all, lifting up Christ in music. In Chronicles uh, 13 and 8, And David and all Israel played before God with all their might, and with singing, and with harps, and with psalteries, and with timbrels, and with cymbals, and with trumpets. Colossians. Let me get there right quick. Colossians 3, and I believe it's 16. It said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This church is very fortunate, blessed, to have good singers. And I thank God for the good singers that we have. I would as soon sit here and listen to the singers here in this church as I had any group that might come in or that I might travel to go and experience. But music has been used in worship from the very first to lift up Christ and to encourage the people, the people of God. Christian music will lift up Christ. It will encourage the people. Did you know that it's true that music can soothe the soul? When King Saul had an attack of depression... They treated him with music in 1 Samuel 16, 16. Let our Lord now command that thy servants 
which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning player on the harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Science agrees that music will calm the soul. You must understand also that some music is not good. Because it incites emotion, not soothes the spirit. See, we have to understand that we must be careful with our music. Remembering that Satan was created as a musical instrument. I take you to Ezekiel 28 and verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the stars, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. He's speaking of Lucifer, an archangel who was created in great beauty and he was created uh, with uh, the ability in music before the throne of God. That he would be, some even say that he was probably in charge of worship before the throne of God. And so he's very, he's very much uh, uh, has a hand in music. And so that's why music today is used. It's not all very godly, is it? And music is used today to incite. Music can depress. It's interesting, and I encourage you to do your own study, but it's interesting that, that people who listen to a particular genre of music, statistics tell us, are more likely to commit suicide. People who listen to a different category of music are more likely to commit crimes. People, and music, while it can soothe the soul, it can also incite. Everything that Satan has and does is done to trick you into drawing away from Christ. So not all music is conducive to worship. And I'm not even talking about the words. I'm talking about the music. The pounding beats and things of the music. Words are a whole other category. But you and I can encourage one another and lift up Christ in good, godly, worshipful music. And yes, that includes the words. <laughs> we, ought to, we, ought to, we ought to sing scriptural songs. By the way, it's just as wrong to sing heresy as it is to preach heresy. Amen. We ought to sing scriptural words to our songs. We ought to have music accompanying it. And, and, and it's, so we can lift up Christ in music and, and set the mood and set the stage for the preaching. And then secondly, we're to be lifting up Christ in ministry. Matthew 20 and 26 says, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. In other words, we don't need to spend time arguing over who has the prominent positions or who's the most important and all of that. We ought to be loving and, and willing to serve one another. The word minister is interesting because we fail to follow through as we should. Minister, the word comes from a root form that means to be an attendant, to run errands, to serve in a religious function. If we're to lift up Christ in ministry, we must also be willing to be an attendant, to run errands, to serve one another in a religious manner. In the modern sense, we think of he who preaches and leads the congregation as being the minister. But in a broader sense, the ministry is that part of the church that serves. It's sad to say that most of the time, 90% of the ministry is done by 10% of the people. Now, it shouldn't be that way, and it don't have to be that way. We ought to all come in, find our, find our place, work together, and uh, fulfill the, the commands of Christ. 
The Lord Jesus has given us orders to follow on how to serve, hasn't He? How to conduct ministry. First and foremost, the church, you and I, are to make disciples. Now, a disciple, by definition, is a follower. One who follows the teaching of another. The object is to gain the confidence of others so that the church can teach them. The process of disciple making requires that the disciple be saved, so then the church must be evangelistic. We're told to go out and to make disciples, right? That means take the good news, the good news that Jesus says, the good news of, well, John 3.16, 3.15, and uh, make disciples. Uh, m as believers come into the fold, then we teach them and train them. So we tell them the gospel in such a way that others might be saved. And then the church is to administer baptism. These are what Jesus told us. At the end of Matthew's gospel, at the end of Mark's gospel, you can read the same command. So the command to baptize was given to the church. That's interesting. It wasn't given to the preacher. It wasn't given to any to one, one person. It was given to the church. So the church is who has authority to baptize. To be dipped. To be plunged beneath the water. Immersion. A picture of death and burial. And resurrection. There is what scriptural baptism is. Immersion into the leadership of Jesus Christ. And lastly, and equal in importance to the other two, is to teach all things Jesus said that He had commanded. So we are to teach the Word of God. That's part of making disciples and training them and bringing them along. Before we pass on to the next point, you must be reminded that ministry is to be accomplished in love. In prayer and in love. Now that brings us to our last point. Lifting up Christ in message. Nicodemus was a master in Jewish law. He knew that he was born wrong. Wasn't that David's testimony? Long years before Nicodemus, wasn't that what David understood? That he was born wrong? He even said that. In sin did my mother conceive me. He understood that it was born wrong. Nicodemus understood the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament. He would have understood that principle. He knew that Adam's fall into sin had passed then on to him, to all people. So Jesus told him there must be something done about the way he was born. That's why he tells him about being born again. All that was left was to be born again. The Lord continued to reach out to Nicodemus with the story of the serpent. Nicodemus understood that it was by faith in God that cured the snake bite. So the Lord pressed upon him the action of the cross and that it must be taken by faith for the cure for our sin problem. Follow now the rest of the verses in the context. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. When 
the Son of Man is lifted up on the cross, then those who believe in Him can have eternal life. The Son of Man, of course, being Jesus, was lifted up and crucified because God so loved the world. See, God does not want you to perish. He does not, in fact, want any to perish. But perish we will if we fail to trust Jesus. If we fail to believe that He can and will save us from the penalty of our sin. Then to really seal the deal, Jesus added these words or completed His interaction with Nicodemus with those words that we just read. See, that is the message that will lift up Christ before others. We, through the delivery of that message, will bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because He deserves to be lifted up in honor and glory. Ephesians 3.21 says, Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. So I ask you, will we make it our business to lift up Christ? To exalt Him. To lift Him up so as to bring glory and honor unto Him before men. That they may see their need that they may also come to Him and look in faith and be saved. Just like Israel had to look in faith to the serpent and be healed, we can look to Jesus in faith and be healed of our sin problem. We can be forgiven, cleansed and made whole, brought into the family. That's my prayer for you. Let's stand. Dear Father, we thank You today again for Your Word. We thank You for the great love that caused you to make a way to, for us to be reconciled unto you, for us to be forgiven, cleansed, made whole, that we could be adopted into your family, O oh God. We thank you for that. And we ask you, Lord, in our feeble attempt to lift up Christ, that you through your Holy Spirit would take these words and minister with them. Draw your people ever closer, and God, draw some lost unto Jesus today. We give you thanks and praise and and glory and honor in Jesus' name, amen.